It's Thursday. It's time for the uh, So What? The Trust Insights Marketing Analytics and Insights Live Show. This week, everyone's on vacation. Like, there's like everyone's gone so which is fine um so this week we're going to talk about uh economic indicators and how to use them in your marketing so let's get started by talking briefly about what economic indicators are because uh obviously it helps to have some uh table setting if you will an economic indicator is nothing more than a metric. It's a measure of some kind, some piece of data, uh, typically about the economy, hence economic indicator. And these are published normally by both government entities and private industry. So there are any number of uh, private industry shops out there that uh, create economic data that you can uh, download, sometimes for uh, astonishingly high fees. Uh, they're Moody's, Morningstar, Bloomberg, etc. And then, of course, there are economic indicator pools that come from governments. Uh, for example, the United States government, the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank has uh, its FRED database. The EU, I know, has a huge uh, economic database. The OECD has their database. And these economic indicators are pieces of data that we can use in our own marketing. Um, hi, Courtney. Uh, nice to see you on the stream. Uh, there's two classes of economic indicator. There's what's called leading and lagging. Uh, a leading indicator is a type of measure which uh, has some predictive power. It tells you about something that's happening right now in the economy that may affect your business later. And then a lagging indicator is an indicator where something has happened and we're seeing the effects of it. So a couple of really simple examples. Um, a leading indicator would be something like producer price index. What companies are paying to make goods, right? If the producer price index goes up, then what happens is that eventually consumer prices have to go up as well. So the consumer price indicator, CPI, would be a lagging indicator and a producer price index in this case would be a leading indicator. If you wanted to know how much more expensive are things going to get, you would use one of those measures. Another good one is what's called the VIX, the Volatility Index, published by the Chicago Board of Options Exchanges. Um, the VIX is a measure of stock market volatility. It is a proxy measure for how comfortable or uncomfortable uh, investors are. The bigger the number is, the more uncertain people feel. Uh, the more uncertain people feel, the more likely it is that people will do something rash, um, sell their stocks, uh, panic, etc. And those would be things that if you were, say, running an investment house, you'd probably want to know about. Uh, and so the VIX is a good predictor of other types of economic uncertainty. So that's sort of what economic indicators are. Let's talk about where do we get these things? How do we get a hold of these things in case that we actually want to use them in our marketing? The number one source that I will recommend is the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank's FRED database. Go to fred.stlouisfed.org. This is a uh, service published by the United States government. Uh, it is applicable mostly to the United States, but there are a, a number of data series in here that uh, are useful for you know, just about anybody. You'll note that they say that you can track up to 817,000 different series from 108 different sources. So this thing is a massive, massive, uh, pool of data. And you can see they've, they're even starting to bring in things like um, job postings, right? So pulling in data from uh, indeed.com so that you can visualize job posting data. So this is this is my by far my favorite clearinghouse. Uh, it is totally free to use. Uh, we'll talk, we'll go through uh, how to use it in just a bit. And it is so robust. It, there, there's a good chance if there's a, a piece of data you'd like to know about an industry or a topic, chances are they probably have it. Another one, if you want to get specific things like uh, stock prices, uh, there's a service called Alpha Vantage, uh, uh, which is a, a stock API. And you can get data like individual stocks, um, some cryptocurrencies, things like that. Uh, the, it is free to use for an exploratory uh, purposes. And you can, of course, get uh, the the paid version if you want some really, really uh, advanced data. This is good if you're looking at specific company stock prices, right? If you, or if you're looking at 
uh, things like cryptocurrency prices for popular cryptocurrencies. Uh, this would be the service to use. So <clears throat> those would be my two favorite data sources. Again, there are plenty of others. Uh, the OECD has some, the EU has some. Find the data source that fits your industry and your, um, your locale, where it is that you're located. So with 817,000 different series, uh, which is, is a lot, um, what are the ones that I pay attention to um, when I'm doing my own economic forecasting, when I'm trying to figure out, for example, answering the question, are we in a recession or not? Um, there's probably about a dozen different economic series that I think are super useful. So let's take a look at, let's go through a few of these. <clears throat> the first one is the, the VIX. Uh, let's go back to Fred here. There you go. So again, this is the volatility index. <clears throat> Fred's interface is very, very straightforward to use. Uh, you have your little time series indicator for uh, how far back you want to look, one year, five year, 10 years, or, or all time. Uh, most series go back to at least 2000, if not into the 90s. Some series like the Dow Jones, for example, uh, goes back to like the 1930s uh, or something like that. <clears throat> the VIX, you can see here, there's... Uh, you can see the, the spikes and then these gray bars indicate periods of recession. And there, there's just a lot of up and down volatility. Of course, here, uh, this is the start of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Volatility was really high. This is the start of the, the Great Recession. Uh, this is the dot-com boom and bust here. And just purely by eyeballing it, you can tell, yeah, it, as of right now, in this sort of period, post-pandemic period, I mean, we're still in, a, we're in two pandemics, but... A lot of people seem to think it's over. Um, you can see that just in general, volatility has been higher than it was in the 10 years previously. There's just more volatility. And you'll note there are even big spikes uh, around big global events, big macro events. Uh, you'll be able to see spikes in, when you dig into the data. Uh, let's take a look here at uh, the one year, uh, right around when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, right? You can see the volatility went Really high up, and you know, recently things seem to be settling down uh, as well. So that's the VIX. I like this index for helping me understand where an invet where investors' heads are. Right. So if your company, if your marketing is reliant on publicly traded companies, uh, this is a good way to see like how is the market overall feeling. The next one uh, is uh, again another basic favorite uh, CPI, the Consumer Price Index. If you market to retail. Uh, if you market to the to the consumer, if you're a B2C company, uh, CPI is a really important number. <clears throat> what you'll notice is that the CPI, many of these measures are benchmarked. So the period between 82 and 84 uh, is sort of benchmarked as that's when they're calling it you know, 100. So everything that happens after that is a multiple of 100. So let's look at CPI for the last year, the Consumer Price Index. As of June and July of 2022, CPI is at 295. That means that on average, prices today are almost three times the prices that they were in 1982 to 1984. That's how you read that number. It is seasonally adjusted, which means it accounts for uh, ebbs and flows. <clears throat> what we see here is crazy levels of inflation, right? <clears throat> so we had a decent amount of inflation all really in the last 10 years. You can see how fast uh, inflation has been growing. But then right around here, um, right once you, the, the pandemic started, you see uh, inflation really taking off. What's behind that? Well, one of the things uh, that is behind that is the, the money supply. Uh, and this is true globally. This is not uh, just the United States. This is, this is globally. In those first months of 2020, the United States government magically made about uh, $4 trillion just appear out of nowhere, right? We just printed $4 trillion. Well, what's the logical consequence of just creating a lot more money? The logical consequence is you get a lot of inflation, right? When you print money, you are inflating the currency. And that effect is what's creating this. So when we're talking about the consumer and what consumers can buy, the, the, the purchasing power of their dollar, CPI tells us that is getting whittled away really, really fast, right? It's it, the, the price has gone up so from about two and a half times um, in the pandemic to almost three times, right? So we're as 
people were losing ground. For forecasting purposes, if you're doing stuff like market mix modeling and things, this might be a very useful indicator to show our external factors like inflation uh, chipping away at your marketing effectiveness. Right. So if you're if you're marketing, you're putting things uh, in, in advertisements, having this data in your modeling, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, could be very useful. Another valuable uh, index is the producer price index. So producer price index is what companies are paying uh, for commodities to do business, right? So what a, if you manufactured um, cars, what would you be paying for steel? If you manufacture foods, what would you be paying you know, farmers? And again, uh, if we just look at the last 10 years, since the, the start of the pandemic, uh, we have seen the cost that companies pay. Again, we're benchmarked to 1982 as the you know, as the level here uh, has gone really, really high. And it's actually a bigger jump for companies than it is for uh, consumers. Uh, at the April 2020, we were at a little bit less than 2x the, the, the producer price index. And now, uh, as of June, we're almost at 3x. So companies' costs are very, very, very high. What does this tell us? For B2B marketers... The producer price index tells you how your B2B clients are doing. Right? If your B2B clients are uh, manufacturing stuff, right? Look, their, their costs have gone crazy, which means that it might be harder to sell to your companies, to your, your, your customers, because they just are, their margins have gotten smaller. They uh, are essentially paying a whole lot more money uh, just to get business done. I think... It's safe to say that in the last two years, uh, a lot of B2B companies, ours included, uh, have seen people uh, take longer to make decisions. Sales cycles have lengthened. Uh, the number of decision makers uh, has, has increased, uh, things like that. So it's, it, it's a good indicator. Um, there's a category of economic indicators I like in shipping. So shipping is a really useful, I think, uh, measure of the economy that are, are good leading indicators. And the reason for this is that unlike a lot of speculative things like stock prices or cryptocurrencies or whatever, shipping only happens when you've got goods and services to move, right? When you need to move stuff from point A to point B by a truck or boat or plane. Therefore, when you look at how shipping um how much shipping is going on, you can get a real sense for what the real state of the economy is. Uh, I have found that shipping is a very good proxy for like holiday retail seasons, right? What are retailers stocking up on? How much are they stocking up on? Uh, it is a good proxy for understanding, hey, the economy's, uh, you know, the supply chain is kind of a, a bit of a mess right now. And it's a good proxy for understanding, like, you know, where, what does economic activity look like? So shipping is benchmarked at 2015. Uh, so 2015 is, is the level, uh, is the, the 100 number. Let's take a look at the last five years. We can see that shipping was increasing pretty steadily and for, for trucks. So this is uh, a truck tonnage in the United States. And then, of course, pandemic hits. Uh, things basically get back, knocked back almost to, to 2015. And it really took... A, you know, it really took till mid 2021 for things to start growing again. So from a, uh, a manufacturing perspective and a supply chain perspective, we're, we're clawing our way back to, you know, sort of 2018, 2019 levels. We're not back to, um, you know, the peak of 2019 when you saw a ton of uh, shipping activity. But this does tell us that the economic recovery is pretty well underway. Another one that is, I think, interesting is internal waterway tonnage. So this is shipping on boats internally within the United States. Now, there's another index that's not included in here called the Baltic Dry Index, which is container pricing. But waterways, I find, uh, at least for when you're looking at United States data, is also a pretty good indicator. You can see here... Um, this one doesn't have an in, uh, a benchmark index. This one just has the raw uh, number of tons of stuff being shipped. And you can see that there are ups and downs. Obviously, there's the really big down here in, in uh, the pandemic. Notice here, even though the pandemic started in really March, April, we didn't see that hit bottom till June. Why? Because this stuff is, is, is 
the consumer demand dropped off and then uh, the, the flow effects, the, the downstream effects hit that industry a few months later. And then, of course, it's, it's slowly coming back. And we can see here in 2022, things are, are close to back to normal. So that is um, the shipping category. One that is relevant to all of us uh, that we all um, do enjoy is food and beverage. So food and beverage, a lot of inflation indexes remove food and beverage from them because it's considered volatile. Right? Uh, there's a lot more volatility than there are other things to measure inflation. The challenge that I have with that assumption is that it people spend money on food and beverage, right? So if you're trying to, to see where the consumer is uh, and, and what's happening to the consumer, you've got to include food and beverage and energy and things like that. So let's look at the last 10 years of inflation uh, for just for food and beverage. You can see um, uh, as soon as the U.S. government started the printing presses and, and you know, just created that extra $4 trillion, uh, there's an immediate short-term bump. Uh, a big part of that was also increased demand because... If you remember in the first few months of the pandemic, when we were all you know, almost planet wide on lockdown, um, what did we do, right? We watched a lot of Netflix we, and we ordered a lot of food um, because there wasn't a whole lot else to do that was safe. Um, and then you see the effects uh, as of you know, this year where, where um, demand levels are very, very high. Uh, we have some supply chain constraints that are causing uh, inflation to really go crazy for food and beverage. So if you are trying to sell in the food and beverage category, obviously, uh, this is a very important number. But also, if you're selling to consumers, this is important because this is eating away at what consumers uh, have available to spend. Another one, we won't go through this one here, but gasoline is a good one, particularly if you are in anywhere in the auto supply chain, price of gasoline is a huge number to keep an eye on. It's a, it's a great leading indicator for demand because as gas prices go up, so do uh, so does obviously uh, demand for cars, particularly certain types of cars, go down. Uh, electric vehicles, for example, tend to do better. A counter indicator, one that is uh, can be very interesting to look at, is the price of, let's see if this is in here, gold. So the price of gold itself um, can be a useful benchmark for understanding where people feel like, um, what kind of safety net they feel like is happening in the market. Let's see. Yeah. So when, when people panic, you know, this one goes, yeah, let's go to maximum. When people panic, the price of gold tends to go up because they, they think that it's a safe haven for their money. Um, you can see here, every time there's a really big recessionary cycle, you see the price of gold goes really, really high. This is an ETF, but you can get the raw price of gold as well. So again, if you're trying to measure investor confidence, a gold price is a, is a good way to do that. Now, let's talk about um, jobs. Jobs is a very, very important category for all of us. One indicator is called the initial claims, initial jobless claims. When uh, people file for unemployment for the first time um, after a period of employment. This category, um, the pandemic threw for a wild, wild uh, swing when you had this huge, massive layoff um, in early April of 2020. It's actually so big, such a big distortion that it, in a lot of forecasts, it's a good idea to exclude that. Um, Looking at just the last year's worth of data, you can see that initial jobless claims have reached uh, lows of 168,000. If we zoom back out here, um, the, we are currently now at nearly all-time lows for jobless claims. Well, what does that mean? Um, that means that people are employed. That means that the price to hire is much higher than it has been. Uh, our candidate pool is much smaller because a lot of people are working, which is good for the economy. It's good for people to be able to obviously earn income. Uh, it is tough if you are trying to hire. When you look at um, sort of the four-week moving average of jobless claims, you can really see that just how much pressure uh, employers are under. Right? We are, have a, a lot of difficulty finding uh, people. There's a whole series... Um, 
from what's called JOLT's Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. This series tells us how many job positions are open. And we're looking at the last uh, almost 20 years. Let's look at the last 10 years. You can see that there was pretty steady numbers of job openings up until the beginning of the pandemic. The pandemic took a, a hatchet job to everything. And then that upset the apple cart substantially and changed the labor pool. And now we are at nearly all time highs for just having open positions, right? So if you are a job seeker, this is good news for you. Um, if you are just recently updated your LinkedIn profile, this is good news for you. If you are a company hiring, this is really bad news because it means that we are all competing very, very heavily for talent. And we talked previously in on one of the Trust Insights podcasts about um, looking at non-traditional uh, talent pools. And this is the clear indicator that that's an avenue I think a lot of people need to go down, uh, which is looking at pools of people that may not have experience in the field that you're hiring for and being willing to train them. Uh, looking at people like returning mothers, people who are returning to the returning parents to the workforce, looking at uh, military veterans who have just exited from the service. You're going to need to dig around and find capable humans and because of uh, just how tight the job situation is. Another... Um, useful indicator is what uh, it costs you know, sort of rent um so if we look at uh rent seasonally adjusted to 1982 uh rent prices right now in major u.s cities are almost 3.7 times higher than they were uh, in in the 80s right and this number if you look carefully you'll notice that it's seeing the inflation effect too mid 2021 rent is just going up really 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 high again this takes dollars out of consumers pocket the, the more expensive rent is uh, the harder it is uh, for people to spend money and also it limits talent pools for companies so again from a hiring perspective this data tells you that you probably want to have a hybrid workforce so that people can live not in super high rent areas if possible and and they'll still be able to afford talent uh, otherwise uh, you're in for a bit of a crunch the last set of indicators that i think are really useful are there's are economic indicators for individual industries so there may be an industry depending on your company that looks at what's happening so let's take a look at the producer price index for consulting. So Trust Insights, we're a consulting firm. What this is saying is that the price for consulting firms um, has gone up really, really high uh, at, at crazy record heights since uh, um, about mid, uh, about early 2021 is when prices just went off the charts. So for a company like us, we, we can look at this and say, well, you know, we are now at 27% uh, higher costs than you know, just uh, 15 years ago. And from a year ago, uh, we are looking at 20% pr increased in prices. If, as we are looking at our pricing for the coming year, from a market perspective, we can look at this and go, wow, if we want to remain competitively priced with our industry competitors, we might need to look at adjusting our prices to incorporate that 20% increase, right? To, so that we don't seem like we're too inexpensive. You may want to do the same thing. Looking at uh, if you're a B2B company, if you are some kind of professional services firm, you may want to look at this number and go, gosh, we might need to increase our prices. Uh, another number is you can look at the number of employees within your industry. You can see that consulting uh, not only rehired uh, the people that had been hiring, but hired a lot more. So this tells us that um, there's been a ton of hiring in the sector, which again explains, uh, can be explained by the, the increases in fees. And you can even get aggregates, and I believe these are somewhat time delayed, but you can get aggregates for um, how much revenue companies are earning just generally in a sector to see like, in, here's the 2009 um, the data for this comes from uh, the Census Bureau, and so it's going to be a little while for them to get this updated. But you can see that um, prices in consulting have gone up considerably. So th that's a sort of a, a tour of my favorite leading economic indicators. Here's the question now. How do you actually make use of this data? How do you take it out of these systems and, and put it to use? Well, 
There's a couple of ways to do this. Um, there's, I would say, three ways to do this. The first, for everybody, regardless of skill level, find a series you care about, right? And just hit the download button on here, and you can download a one-time uh, snapshot of the data as you've arranged it here, put it into a spreadsheet, put it into uh, a PowerPoint chart, whatever. And again, very useful, very easy. Uh, this is something that I think is very helpful if you're trying to put together a presentation to your stakeholders to say like, here's why our costs have gone up so much because, and you show them the appropriate charts. That's the, the simplest, easiest, no tools, no technical skills required, just uh, hit the buttons and, and make things happen. The second way is you'll notice that this, the Fred service allows you to connect its data to its data through what are called APIs, application programming interfaces. If you sign up for a free um, access key with it, you can then take that resource and you can, let's go ahead and edit this. You can actually connect to Fred's database within a tool like Google Data Studio. So if you wanted to bring in uh, series data, you can connect through their free API and bring in any kind of economic data into Data Studio so you can put it side by side next to other reports. The third way is to have the data in some kind of live export. So there, again, there are really good tools. Tableau software is, is one such tool uh, like Data Studio. The R programming environment, which is where I do most of my uh, work, uh, again, allows you to just plug right in um, and manipulate the data directly. I like visual tools like Tableau a lot, particularly for exploring data, because the raw data is kind of tough to look at. And sometimes you want to do comparisons. Sometimes you want to be able to look at individual series. So having something like all the data brought into Tableau for multiple series allows you to see um, the big picture of what's going on. Um, this is the last 22 years worth of data from a whole bunch of different uh, indicators. And you can see there's like a whole bunch of extra noise here. If this is, of course, the, the big dislocation that happened in April 2020. Um, then you can go through and choose any of the individual numbers and see what's going on with it. So this, for example, is the price of uh, Brent crude oil. Let's go down to a uh, week number here. Uh, Brent crude oil, if you're not familiar, is the price of a barrel of oil. And generally speaking, it's a pretty safe bet um, that whatever the, the price of a barrel of oil is, if you divide it by roughly three or four, um, depending on, on where you live, um, you're going to get the price per gallon in the United States and you know, adjust that obviously to the price per liter in whatever currency uh, for the rest of the world that uses metric. Uh, you can see here that back in uh, June of this year, we hit a, an all-time high of $95 per barrel. Uh, and no surprise, back then, uh, gas prices were close to $5 a, a gallon, right? So uh, really, really high prices. And we can see this reflected here in, in the data. Again, this is, this is an excellent leading economic indicator because if you know what the price per barrel is, you know that in four to six weeks, uh, normally for the, for the refining industry, that's what the price of the, at the pump is going to be. So if you know that things are on a downswing right now, um, you can see, okay, well, I, I know what's going to happen. When, for example, a hurricane comes through uh, here in the United States, uh, it can throw production, uh, substantial production delays. That can increase the price, the not only the time delay, but also the price uh, per barrel uh, because you're running into extraction issues. And that, of course, creates uh, higher gas prices down the road. So that's a couple, a couple of easy ways and one not so easy way to get the data out of a system like Fred. Now, here's the question. What do we do with this information. At the most basic level, when you're looking at things like jobs or when you're looking at uh, things like the number of employees in an industry or you're looking at uh, the amount of freight that's being shipped, when you talk to your customers, when you talk to their customers, if you're B2B, um, ask them what things keep them up at night, what things are challenging them, and then 
see if you can find economic indicators in that supply chain that let you be more proactive, be more pro predictive. Let's say you have a company that is uh, a company that makes cars, right? What are the what's the supply chain for cars? There's things like rubber. There's things like CPU and, and chip prices. There's things like steel. Um, there's things like fabrics and cloth. If you pull together maybe four of those supply chain things and you put them in a chart or a workbook like this, you could take a look at what's happening upstream for your company, for your customer and say, hey, there's some price spikes happening here, here, and here. That means that in three months, six months, whatever, we're going to see higher prices or reduced capacity at our company. And so you can immediately begin to forecast this stuff and get ahead of disruptions that other people aren't paying attention to. That's the thing about leading economic indicators. If you understand your supply chain and the metrics from these economic indicators that feed your supply chain, you can predict what's going to happen before other people know it. Right? You can know what's going to happen because a cost increase or a decrease upstream naturally is going to flow downstream. Look for series that are in your industry specifically or that affect a certain type of customer. If you know that you have a certain type of customers, uh, for example, one of our customers uh, is a company that makes uh, that does stuff around cars, right? So price of gasoline, very, very important. When the price of gasoline goes up, people get much more interested in our clients' uh, services. So we keep an eye on this, right? You keep an eye on your, uh, your, your price of gas, your price of uh oil and stuff like that and understand okay if gas goes above a certain number people are going to be very interested in what the, what our, our client has to offer uh, as an, off, an offset so it's an indicator it's a way for them to spin up marketing campaigns to say like hey if you're interested in some, saving some money uh you know check out our product or service uh, you know for example you can see gas prices in the united states you know uh, scaled uh, it reached a peak in at the end of may and it's slowly starting to come down but it's still very very high historically <clears throat> and finally if you have um very very sophisticated um attribution modeling or marketing mix modeling uh, there are ways to bring in some of this data into your marketing mix models themselves um, these uh, models will allow you to say like, I, I care about, I know these indicators are probably going to be impactful. Let's bring this in and see if it impacts our marketing mix, right? So uh, example is um, Facebook has a, a marketing mix modeler. And one of the things I bring into it for is that the VIX number, the investor confidence number. When investor confidence is going the wrong way, does it change the behavior of, of people who are looking at Trust Insights products and services? Uh, the answer, thankfully, at least when I ran it earlier today, uh, is no, it has a very minimal impact on, uh, on what people are looking for our services. But you could clearly see that there are some industries where that would be a, a major contributor, right? If maybe you're doing cryptocurrency stuff or maybe you're just doing regular stock investing. If investor confidence is down, uh, you're going to see that play out in the market. And if you can accommodate for that, then you can change your marketing mix model to say, okay, when, when this is down, when investor confidence is down, let's pull back on our ad spend, or maybe we turn up our ad spend depending on, uh, depending on what your customers are interested in. So to recap, economic indicators can offer a lot of value in terms of predicting what's likely to happen, especially if you understand your supply chain well, especially if you know which indicators matter most to your business and your customers. Most of the data that you could want, not all, but, but most, is available for free from services like the OECD, the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, um, the EU. Um, chances are whatever your government's central bank is, as long as they're trustworthy, um, the data is uh, probably available to you for, well, you, it's not free. Your tax dollars are paying for it. Um, pick indicators that are good for your industry and then export the data into systems that you have control over uh, that you can use to either just make general assessments about what's happening in the, in the economy, what's happening to your customers, or at the most sophisticated level, build it into marketing mix models 
and attribution models as a way of saying these things may be increasing or depressing our ability to get great results from our marketing efforts. So that's the show for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. Next week, I believe everybody should be back. So it will be uh, back to more of the uh, the Three Stooges, if you will. <laughs> um, if you've got comments or questions, you know, hit us up here or in the Slack group. I'll have a, a thing about that shortly. But thanks for tuning in today. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for watching today. Be sure to subscribe to our show wherever you're watching it. For more resources and to learn more, check out the Trust Insights podcast at trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast and a weekly email newsletter at trustinsights.ai slash newsletter. Got questions about what you saw in today's episode? Join our free Analytics for Marketers Slack group at trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers. See you next time.